This module will introduce some aspects of rainfall estimation via radar, with a particular emphasis on converting radar variables, including radar reflectivity factor and other dual polarimetric variables, to rain rate. We may be interested in estimating rainfall for several reasons. First of all, rain gauges only provide information about point locations on the ground, but radar data provides continual coverage in space, although with larger uncertainty. Therefore, the potential for flash flooding can be warned using radar data. Rainfall estimates derived from radar can be used for a variety of other research and technical applications as well. For example, because precipitation is related to latent heat release in the atmosphere, the amount of rainfall observed via remote sensing can provide some insight on the structure of the general atmospheric circulation. The most common way to estimate rainfall from radar is to use the radar reflectivity factor in a Marshall-Palmer, or ZR, relationship. It is simply a power law relationship between reflectivity and the rain rate R. Some examples of ZR relationships used for conversion of WSR88D reflectivity to rain rate are shown at the bottom. Each type of rainfall regime possesses its own pair of coefficients, A and B, as seen in the equation above or in the algebraically re-manipulated equation. The relationships are obtained empirically, as we will see an example of shortly. The relatively recent dual polar metric capabilities of WSR88D radars allow for usage of ZDR and KDP in addition to Z to estimate rainfall. We'll see examples of such relationships like this as well soon. However, for radars without dual polarimetric capabilities, only ZR relationships can be used, like these seen here and others. We'll start by looking at the simple ZR relationships in more detail first. The table shows how rain rate in millimeters per hour increases for increasing reflectivity. That increase differs dependent upon the type of convection present, which is what these two columns are. A 40 dBZ echo in deep summertime convection in a moist environment will have a larger rain rate than the same echo in a region of gentler ascent. So the dynamics that are tied to the reflectivity are important. However, one limitation is that all of these estimates are deterministic. As we know, a variety of drop size distributions and shapes within a range gate can give us the same Z. However, that variety may represent vastly different volumes of water. This figure illustrates observed rain rate as a function of reflectivity. Here's rain rate, here's reflectivity. Both variables were observed by a distrometer, or derived from observations from a distrometer, a ground-based instrument that directly measures the drop size distribution. From the drop size distribution, both the liquid water volume and the equivalent radar reflectivity factor can be determined. The red and blue dots on this plot represent data from two tropical islands and they generally agree pretty well, the colors do. The black solid and orange dashed lines represent ZR relationships. Note again that these relationships may vary significantly depending on the location and type of rainfall. For example, ZR relationships over the continental US during winter would likely be very different. And one last thing to note about this plot is that we're working on the logarithmic scale here on the y-axis for rain rate. Let's take a closer look at the estimated rain rate for reflectivity of 30 dBZ, this green line here. The estimated rain rate at the center of the line here along the black and orange lines is about 3 millimeters per hour, which is denoted by this horizontal green line, intersecting the black and orange lines at 30 dBZ. However, if we consider the spread in observed rain rate for the bulk of observations at 30 dBZ, we might actually get a rain rate anywhere between about 1.5 and 6.5 and millimeters per hour. That's almost a halving or doubling of a deterministic estimate. So clearly, ZR relationships, or any empirically derived dual pole relationships for that matter, are limited in their ability to absolutely estimate rainfall rate at a single point in time and space. At 40 dBZ in yellow, the absolute uncertainty in rain rate is even larger, with a potential rain rate roughly spanning from 8 to 30 millimeters per hour. As opposed to a deterministic estimate of rainfall, 
which assigns a single estimate of rain rate based on one value of reflectivity. We can express potential rainfall as a probabilistic range if we have enough data to create a well-populated distribution of rain rate across a wide range of reflectivity. The plots shown in the top row of the slide are actually just zoomed in on 1 dB wide sections of the plot on the previous slide. For example, in the middle plot here, we can see more clearly how the rain rate ranges from about 1.5 to about 6.5 millimeters per hour. Other spreads can also be seen in other 1 dB wide reflectivity bins. So here from 15 to 16 and here for much larger reflectivity, 45 to 46 dBZ. Thus, instead of reporting rainfall as some median or mean value that is like at the peak of the distribution, it can be reported as a probability distribution function, or PDF, three of which are seen on the bottom row and correspond to the panels at the top. Each PDF peaks along the y-axis at the most likely rain rate listed on the x-axis. So for example, right here, this PDF peaks at like a little over 0.2, which is where most of the points are clustered in the top left panel, and about two here for the middle panel, and you see that here for the bottom middle as well. Uncertainty increases as the PDF widens. So a narrow PDF would be one in which only a narrow range of possible rain rates could occur. For the middle bottom panel, note how the PDF has a bit of a secondary bump in the rain rate near 4 to 5 millimeters per hour. Let's look at this more closely. Precipitation can occur in regions of strong vertical motion, which is often alluded to as convective rainfall, or in regions of weaker vertical motion, which is called stratiform rainfall. And in this plot, convective is red, stratiform is blue. We'll get to this in a minute. Moderate reflectivity, such as around 30 dBZ, is frequently observed in both types of rainfall regimes, whereas low reflectivity, say less than 20 dBZ, is more often found in stratiform, while very strong reflectivity, say in excess of 40 dBZ, is generally found in strong convection. In a little bit, we'll briefly discuss how the two rain types can be determined using radar data. However, they can also be roughly estimated at a distrometer based on the drop size distribution. When we compute rain rate PDFs for the 30 to 31 dBZ bend separately for convective and stratiform precipitation, we get two very different distributions that only overlap at their tails. Stratiform rainfall at 30 to 31 dBZ, denoted by this blue line, typically rains within a range of about 1 to 4.5 millimeters per hour, while convective rainfall at the same reflectivity typically, typically rains at about uh, 2 to 8 millimeters per hour. Thus, the primary peak in the total PDF, which is the black line, is mainly caused by stratiform rain, and the long tail on the distribution with the small bump near 4 to 5 millimeters per hour is caused by convective rainfall having the same reflectivity. So this means that stratiform is probably more common than convective at 30 dBZ, but if you get a, one of these high rain rates, it's probably a convective 30 dBZ echo. What this also means is that ZR relationships can be separately computed for convective and stratiform echo to better reduce the uncertainty in an estimate. There are a few reasons that such spread exists in the rainfall PDFs. Part of the reason to do has to do with variability in drop size distributions. The top left figure shows outlines of raindrops captured by an aircraft-based cloud drop probe. As you can see, a wide variety of drop sizes can occur depending on the kinematics found within a cloud. But even within the same part of a cloud, a variety of drop and droplet sizes are present. The bottom right panel shows examples of drop size distributions seen in various tropical cyclones, with each color representing data from a different storm. And the size of the drop is at the bottom, and the number of concentration of those drops and logarithmic scale is on the y-axis. The distributions all occurred when reflectivity was near 40 dBZ in this example. Drop size distributions often follow what we call gamma distributions, which is just a type of mathematical PDF, which is more of the focus of a cloud physics course than remote sensing. But the main point here is that at the tail end of the upper part of the distribution, the number of the largest drops varied, sometimes significantly, between these different storms. 
For example, the orange line, this top one, represents about one order of magnitude more three and a half millimeter wide drops than the other lines. The reflectivity is most sensitive to the size of these drops, the big ones, meaning that the reflectivity is similar for all of the distributions. However, some distributions actually contain more water than others and would therefore likely result in a larger rain rate of the surface. To get a 40 dBz echo, a volume could consist of a very large number of small drops, although this is unlikely over here. More likely the volume would contain a relatively small number of large drops, or somewhere in between, with a few large drops and a bunch of small drops that make little impact on reflectivity used to estimate the rain rate. The canting angles of the large drops matters as well because it affects the backscatter cross-section to the radar which is especially important for radars without dual polarimetric capability. A few ways exist to get around the problem of having such wide-ranging possibilities for rainfall based on a single observation of reflectivity. One commonly used technique called cryging involves blending the radar estimates with relatively isolated rain gauge and distrometer data located within a radar domain. This works quite well in places where you have ground-based data. Shown here is an example of one day observed rainfall product from NOAA over the southwestern United States. That is an example of a product derived using such a blended technique. However, over the ocean, we don't have rain gauge or distrometer data outside of the occasional data point on an island. In these cases, we are far less able to constrain rainfall rates satisfactorily. This is where a probabilistic estimate of rainfall can become particularly useful. However, deterministic estimates like the ZR relationships shown earlier are still frequently used. We'll look at both the probabilistic and the deterministic methods next, starting with deterministic. To the right is a diagram outlining one example of a decision tree for dual polymetric rainfall estimation that uses not just Z, but also ZDR and KDP to estimate rainfall. Four different types of relationships can be formed based on the magnitude of each variable following this decision tree. An example of a ZZDRR relationship is seen at bottom left. ZDR and KDP are typically only used if they are large, following this part and this part of the decision tree, and indicate that oblate raindrops are present, which would skew the rain rate estimated using Z only and assuming a spherical drop. In the event that both ZDR and KDP are small, a standard ZR relationship can be used, using separate ones depending on the type of precipitation occurring. But when we do use the dual polymetric variables, it can help us better constrain the rain rate compared to using Z only. For example, if you have a bunch of flat drops that have a large horizontal reflectivity component but a small vertical one, then putting the ZDR in an equation like this would actually reduce the rain rate because the high ZDR is telling you that you actually have a smaller rain volume than the Z value alone would indicate. Spread is still present in rain rate even when using dual pole relationships to estimate rainfall. Separate dual pole relationships can be computed for convective and stratiform echo as well, which helps to constrain the uncertainty. The 2D histograms of ZD ZDR is shown at top left for distrometer data that we looked at earlier with an example of a split into convective and stratiform seen by the different colors at top center. The other panels show distrometer derived fields associated with the drop size distribution in the Z ZDR space. The probabilistic method again can account for the spread and potential rain rates given some value of reflectivity. Consider also that the data we looked at on the last slide was derived from ground-based data. However, radar data observes backscattered radiation at some altitude above the ground. Therefore, uncertainty associated with estimating rainfall from radar comes not just from the drop size distribution in a volume, but also the discrepancy between the reflectivity observed at some height of the radar beam and the corresponding reflectivity directly beneath that at the ground where the rainfall is actually observed by a distrometer from which the rain rate relationships are empirically derived. This plot shows a two-dimensional histogram that describes rain rate for 31 dBz echo observed at an altitude of 1300 meters. 
the actual reflectivity of the ground in this subset of data for such an echo, based on radar data, may range from anywhere between 26 and 38 dBc, which given the distributions of rain rate we explored earlier, ends up corresponding to a potential rain rate between 1 and 8 millimeters per hour approximately. The maximum likelihood is denoted by the center of the PDF where the darkest colors are shown, which is around 3 to 4 millimeters per hour, for a most likely surface reflectivity of 33 dBc, a little larger than the 31 dBc measured above the ground. This type of approach leads to its own set of complications as well, however, and we will not dive deeply into them at all. However, spatial and temporal autocorrelation must be considered, to put it short. For example, if we know something about the drop size distribution in one part of the radar domain, say over here, this probably allows us to narrow the likely width of PDS used to estimate radar or rainfall elsewhere in the radar domain. Uh, so if we were to know, for some reason, what the appropriate rain rate for this reflectivity is over here, then there's a good chance that the surrounding reflectivities would come from a similar part of the distribution. Mathematically modeling this autocorrelation in space and time is a bit challenging and still an active area of research. Finally, we have mentioned convective and stratiform rainfall at length in this module because the drop size distributions found within two basic types of rainfall differ substantially. The rainfall types can be identified subjectively in radar data, allowing us to apply different rain rate relationships in space. And so in this example, we're splitting the distrometer data up into stratiform and convective, but next we're going to look at how to do this with radar. One common way to do this is via evaluation of the two-dimensional reflectivity field at some height generally one and a half to two and a half kilometers above the surface. Local peaks and reflectivity, such as you know these right here, which are often also very high reflectivity, generally indicate convective echo, while weaker reflectivity, like in this area right here, that varies more smoothly in space, is more likely to be stratiform. In this image, an example of reflectivity is shown here at the left, and the corresponding rain type classification, objectively determined, for the same echoes as illustrated at right. Some isolated echoes, which tend to be shorter than deep convection, are indicated by some shades of blue. The convection itself, the deepest convection denoted by the purples, is actually fairly isolated uh, or relatively infrequent and is surrounded by this mixed sort of stratiform convective uncertain echo. The performance of such methods can be evaluated if we know the vertical profiles of vertical motion on the left hand side or the latent heating within them on the right hand side. These are difficult to measure directly but can be simulated in a model which is where these plots come from by running a algorithm to do the rain type classification on simulated reflectivity out of a model. This figure simply shows that the profiles of each convective and stratiform in two different algorithms are roughly consistent with what we would expect from atmospheric dynamics and thermodynamics. And that is, convective rainfall is generally coincident with latent heat release through a deep layer of the atmosphere. So that's what this dark line is. Here's heating over here. Stratiform rainfall generally occurs in regions where diabatic heating is maximized above the zero degree sea level and then is cooling somewhere underneath. The top and bottom rows show the results of mean vertical velocity and latent heating profiles using two different algorithms. This is one and then this is one. And shows that the separate classification of shallow convection is important in order to not incorrectly classify it as stratiform rainfall which would give you this peak down here that's not really there in stratiform rainfall and thereby would cause an incorrect rain rate relationship to be used. Now this is not perfect either. There's some issues with the stratiform. As you can see, the, the cooling is a little bit elevated uh, when we would expect it to actually be lowered down in the troposphere. But to first order, we can separate uh, the rain type and the ZR relationship we need to use based on just the horizontal distribution of the reflectivity field in radar data.